afternoon, everyone. My name is Justine. Thanks for tuning in and welcome back to the Starboard Portal. Today we have U.S. sailors Bella Casaretto, Marion Leppert, and Geronimo Norris with high performance coach Phil Muller and U.S. Olympic Direct Development Director Leandro Spina. Please enjoy today's panel exploring the world of windsurfing and the progression for foil boarding through these three sailors' experiences and future aspirations. Thanks, Phil, for moderating and please we encourage anyone to ask questions in the chat box. And with that, Phil, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Justine. Thanks everyone for tuning in and welcome. It's great to connect with you all here and now. Um, type some questions into the feed. We're gonna work those into the conversation as they come up. Um, Marion, Geronimo, Bella, I'm thrilled uh, to have you all here to talk about one of my absolute favorite things in the world, windsurfing foiling and the future of the sport. I'll share with you uh, that my connection is like a very visceral one, not only the speed, but the sensation of skimming across the water and using a whole, my whole body fingers to position the sail, the toes under uh, with the board under my feet, but all that's changing with the demands and the new techniques of the foil. You three um, come with the sport from very different places, but all very successful. So really excited to talk and hear from you. Marion, let's kick it off with you. you. You come from the Bay Area, which has a very rich culture uh, in your upbringing, the early 2000s of windsurfers and then leading with foiling now. You grew up windsurfing from your dad taught you, you know, what do you love about the sport and, and what keeps you connected to it? Uh, I think what drew me to the sport initially was really the speed. Like I, my older sister used to sail lasers and I was like, no way, I, I want to do something faster. Uh, so that was my initial draw to the sport. Um, but then it was really just about being on the water. Um, and for the first two or three years, that was kind of the passion that I developed was the idea of like skimming along on the bay in San Francisco is just the most beautiful feeling. Um, and then I got introduced to racing with uh, the small fleet of sailors in San Francisco. Um, and that was just the most fun, like Friday nights and Saturdays that I would um, have every week. Um, just the community of people there were super supportive and just wanted to have a good time on the water, but a bit competitive too. So it gave some kind of an adrenaline rush on the starting line uh, in SF. Um, and then obviously the, the sport has a really awesome international scene of people that are interested in racing and um, that's just uh, brings up the competition a bit more and makes it that much more fun. Um, so I guess for me, it was really the speed on the water, the just enjoying being out there and also kind of having this competitive adrenaline side to the sport as well. It's amazing, Marion, you've had a uh, great success in, in the formula class you know, before shifting to the one design, you were fourth at Youth Worlds on the Techno, you know, second at Europeans, you medaled at the Pan Am Games, and you went on to represent the U.S. in Rio at the Olympics. Um, you mentioned the international group uh, and international side of competition. You know, you call San Francisco home, and I personally can't think of a more challenging venue to call home as a training base. Um, however, Training for big competition, there's a clear divide in skill, I would say, between the domestic and international fleet and windsurfing, or at least there used to be. Um, you know, what, what do you devote your, your rise to the top to as you climb the ladder up the ranks? I mean, the place I came from, San Francisco, I think is absolutely responsible for helping me get out there like the there was a group of maybe 15 or so guys who were just pushing themselves out on the water for fun um, and I was this like 11 year old trying to keep up with them and I think just being pushed out so early to really go faster and not be afraid uh, really gave me the tools to, for success later on um, and I think the conditions in San Francisco if you get exposed to them when you're 11 it's not so scary um, so when I was sailing out outside of the rest of the world it was like I felt really confident that I already knew how to sail in this stuff and that I um, could get better if I just put my mind to it. Um, I found the most challenging uh, part of getting into the scene actually was just 
um, figuring out how to learn new skills that I had never seen before based off of the conditions. The really five knots for me was the scariest because I had no idea what to do in those kinds of stuff. But I think um, being part of the San Francisco crew where people were just um, ready to share advice off the water if all you had to do was ask. Um, and I think not being afraid to ask to, for help from other people um, to see like what were they doing out on the water that day, what went through their mind, and just not being afraid to take that kind of a mindset to the international scene and realizing that people um, racing out there are also excited to share um, skills. And if you can help them out a little bit in what you're good at, they'll help you out as well. Um, and so I just kind of had that mindset going into the international scene and um, had some success there. Um, I think the other big key is just finding a good group of people that mesh well. So I um, was super lucky that uh, I guess I'm originally from France and France is a huge windsurfing community as well. And so they were, um, I kind of became, tried to make more friends um, outside of the US as well, because I think uh, the US is a great group of sailors, but um, it's good to tap into other um, teams as well. Um, and so they kind of adopted me for a while and then just went, I hopped between different training camps and just being um, not shy about asking to join other people's um, trainings was really valuable because I got to see different, um, different ways of approaching um, in how to improve on the race course. Um, so, yeah. Well, the windsurfing community, the fast boat community, uh, it's just amazing the culture of sharing that's out there and bringing people together and all just learning, uh, learning from other people's experience is amazing. Geronimo, I'm going to kick it to you and bring you in on this topic. You come from a really strong windsurfing family uh, and grew up competing very young with great success, second place at the the Techno Worlds under 15, you won the gold medal at the Youth Worlds uh, in 2018 on the RSX. Your siblings, all your brothers, Maxi and Manu, as well as your former teammates, uh, the Kramer brothers in Miami, you had such a rich group of talent sailing there. You know, what role has having strong training partners, what, what has that done for your sailing? I mean, I think I credit that a huge part of my sailing career, I'd say. Um, no one really likes to go out on the water alone. And I, for example, I originally started windsurfing, not necessarily because I was that interested in windsurfing, but more because my older brother did it and I just wanted to beat him. I want to be better than him. You know, so then uh, this kind of dialogue started where it was between my two brothers and our, all our training partners, the Kramers and people that came in one as well it was just constantly trying to up each other and figuring out what the other person was doing better than you sharing information. Um, kind of all in the pursuit of goal, all in the pursuit of, again, just winning. Everyone just wanted to win. So we were constantly just fighting, bickering, and just, I guess, sailing our hearts out on the water. Um, so although, again, we didn't have the largest training group uh, ever seen, we had, I think, a really good group who was really dedicated. So just being able to work together with everyone and really devote our attention and our energy into what we wanted to do um, was super helpful. It's quality, not quantity, right, Momo? Absolutely. That's amazing. That's amazing. Hey, Bella, let's bring you in on this conversation uh, as we're talking about sailing backgrounds. You know, you maybe have the most relatable sailing background as far as uh, a conventional youth sailor. You started in the Opties at your local club and were extremely successful going to the world's team racing, um, winning big youth events like Orange Bowl, not only in the Opti, but also in the 29er. And in the 29er class, Bella, you have a silver and a gold medal at the youth world's and were recently nominated for Rolex Yachts Woman of the Year. My simple question to you, my question to you is simple. What brought you to windsurfing and, and what do you like about it? So basically Berto is, is going off to college. So I knew I needed to kind of figure out how I'm gonna sail when she leaves. I have to like move on. Cause originally I really wanted to sail to FX with Berta. But, you know, it's just like not that convenient. But the most convenient is windsurfing 
because it's so easy to move around. I can go sail by myself and it's also really fast. Want to go faster always, so. Yeah. And, and how are you liking it so far? It's great. I'm like, even during this quarantine, I'm able to get in sailing because it's just so convenient. And I'm able to like, it's just so fun, like starting a new class and like starting from the beginning and like going through like all the struggles of like, just like not being able to figure something out. And like, it's just so fun. That's amazing. That's amazing. You're talking about Bella, you're talking about your teammate uh, going to school. Marion, you uh, took some time off your undergraduate career at Stanford University during your Olympic trials for Rio. Uh, I think you had a little over a month between events and you were seated second for that Olympic spot before the second qualifier. Can you share a little bit with us about making that decision you know, the process that you went through and ultimately the realization of your dream, which uh, was to, to go to the Olympics. Yeah, uh, honestly, it was the best decision. Uh, one of the best decisions I've ever made to take that year off. Like it was, um, it always been my dream to go to the Olympics and I knew that I would regret it if I didn't give it my all. Um, and I almost regret not taking more time off from school because school is always going to be there for you um, and it, the Olympics won't. Um, but I think after the end of my sophomore year of college, I realized that it was really hard to do both windsurfing and school at the same time. And I really felt like if I put my mind to it, I could get much better at windsurfing, um, especially for the RSX. Um, and so I think uh, also finding a coach that I worked well with right before, uh, during my sophomore year, I felt like I finally had like a committed individual who could really um, support me and, and um, help me really improve rather than just me kind of figuring things out on my own. And so once those two key factors kicked in, um, I took that year off. Um, and it was honestly like the most fun adventure um, I can recall in my in my life to date. Um, because you're, you're just you get to windsurf for for a year, you know, like that's, that's pretty special. And you get to fully commit your mind to this one goal, um, as opposed to kind of juggling a bunch of stuff. Um, and you can actually feel like you're, you're aiming for this um, full improvement of yourself as a sailor that you wouldn't otherwise get to experience. Um, and then in terms of the, the Olympic trials, um, I have to say that that was probably um, the worst part to live through. Uh, by any means like the the year I took off I knew all in the back of my mind the entire time that like there was a risk like maybe I would take this whole year off and then have to go back to school and not really um you know get to live through the dream that I was hoping for um and so it, it really put some pressure on me because I really wanted it um and at the end of Miami it was again a situation where I just was too uncertain about failing in the kind of um, wishy-washy winds that I never see in San Francisco um, and it it was really tough um, I think the kind of advice or mentality that my dad kind of helped me go through is just Marian, like you've you've shown before that you are completely capable of taking something you're not good at and just turning that on its head and um, figuring out the steps that you need to get there. Um, and so that was just the only conversations I was allowed to have during the two months between the second part of my trial was just, you're not allowed to complain that you're not doing well. You can just, you're only allowed to talk about like, how are you gonna um, fix this, this problems and like which which are the key things that you need to change and what can you make the most um, progress on um, and my coach also was really good at this he we set up some training camps where um, previously in my training camps had been really focused on trying to get surrounded by the best sailors around there but we kind of changed the mentality between my two olympic trials and instead we went to um, let's go to some training camps where you're really going to be able to squish people like find some groups of kids that aren't necessarily the best in the world but where you're going to be really confident and you're going to actually you know um feel like you're you're the best one out there and that you're you've um you've put those things that you've worked on to um, and actually made some improvements and then um I think I went into the second part of my trials feeling like I'd given it my all and got a little bit lucky with the weather and my dream came true wow that's amazing uh thanks for recounting that to us you, you mentioned focusing on, on solving problems and not getting hung up on, uh, on the problems themselves. And 
trying to eliminate those distractions. I'm curious, uh, Momo, did, uh, did as Marion was describing her training leading up to the, the qualifiers for the games and then the games, you know, does that, any of that resonate with you training for Youth Worlds? Oh, absolutely. I mean, as Marion described it, it's a single-minded effort. You know, I, there was a certain point where I'd always been training and working hard, but we, we sat down with my coaches and we really set a goal for the youth world. And we were like, okay, this is what we're going to do now. How are we going to do it? Um, and at that point, it's, it's pretty frustrating as a sailor. Um, you've been sailing for years. You work hard every day. And for someone to pull out a piece of paper with absolutely all your flaws and what you're missing, basically tell you where you suck and how, um, at the end of the day it was like a realistic a very realistic approach that helped me kind of turn around the way I sailed and the way I approach racing um it helped me develop like a much more mature mindset in terms of training in terms of competing in terms of fitness dieting all aspects really of competition so um again I had a I was finishing school before youth worlds I was finishing high school so as soon as I finished and the last month before I finished, really, it was kind of, okay, now that school is kind of set up and squared away, it was completely diving into world's, world's preparation and the final preparations we needed. So, um, again, it was just checking boxes, checking boxes off the list and kind of tackling the problems we need to tackle. So it was every day heading out onto the water with a goal. And after analyzing, again, whether we were able to accomplish something or not, and what were the quickest and most efficient ways to progress as a sailor, rather than um, trying to find perfection, you know, it was progress over perfection. So just trying to dial everything in as much as you could. Um, approaching, again, I think like Marion talked, I wasn't traveling to Europe to train with what were considered the best groups at that time. I was more focused on training um, in venue, training with people I was very comfortable with, very confident with, and whose abilities I knew well. So I could kind of mark my progress or gauge my progress against the other sailors. So it was just like a very disciplined, um, practical approach to sailing. It, we decided to simplify everything as much as we could and move forward with that. And it, it worked out. I mean, it's proven the strategy. Yeah, congratulations. I love that you said progress versus perfection. I wrote that down in my notes. Um, and you also brought up tackling problems. You know, I have to ask, you've been through some, some battles with your health uh, and you won the youth worlds nearly a year after your diagnosis of uh, type two diabetes. You know, what did you learn from that challenge and, and how did it change your relationship to the sport, your approach to training yeah, so um, uh, around exactly a year before Youth Worlds, I had been racing two world championships back to back in Europe. And I mean, I don't know what the cause was, but um, during the second one, I ended up not being able to compete. I was feeling really sick and I was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. And after that, um, to be honest, I was kind of emotionally crushed. I was kind of like my world was, my world as an athlete was turned over. Um, you spend so much time working on your body and recognizing your body as an athlete and learning to read it and really tell what, what is happening, how much you're training, how much you can push, how much you can. And uh, being diagnosed again with an illness kind of shattered my system apart in that sense. So I think that was just a clear example of me having to sit down and kind of reevaluate what approach I wanted to take moving forward. Um, and looking at it now, I'm not saying I would do it all again and see, meaning I wouldn't be diagnosed again, like for fun, but having been through the experience, I will say that it made me much more aware of myself, my athletic capabilities, my limits, and kind of really made me reevaluate the discipline I use approaching athletics in every aspect. Um, so it helped me kind of refocus my mindset. Um, in a sense, it really kind of tested me. And so I had to really sit down and have kind of inner dialogue and figure out what I really wanted from windsurfing, whether it was my passion or not, and whether or not I was willing to put in all the work to overcome this challenge and to really train to return to the level I had been at before the diagnosis. 
So um, after having, again, very clearly realized that, yes, I wanted to do this and this is what I love to do, um, I kind of became hyper-focused on, again, just improving day to day. Um, it was it was a base, basically baby step process in which all aspects of the competition, whether nutrition, I, I mean, for as windsurfers, you know, fitness is a huge part of our sport. So kind of these aspects, really tuning them in and fighting that, I think that was my biggest battle. Um, my battle with my body rather than my head. My head, I think, was where it needed to be at. So it was kind of just working out what I what I needed to do moving forward. And yeah, uh, it was kind of an uphill battle. But uh, after the fact, I can say it was definitely well worth it. And if I was in that same position, I would do it again. It was it was amazing. That's truly inspiring, Momo. Um, you know, you talk about self-reflection. I think we're all at a moment of pause here globally and we're reflecting a lot on uh on our values and and all reevaluating our relationship to the sport and probably just hoping that we can get out on the water as soon as possible those who can't um hey bella let's let's hear from you a little bit you know as marion and momo shared their process um for preparing for those big events can you talk to us a little bit about what was in your mind and what you were focused on on your lead up to your your youth world success? Um, so a little different from them, I have a partner. So a lot of our focus was mostly just on communication and learning how to be in the boat and like solve through problems together and like learning how to control our emotions and like just getting through it. But, um, you know, we always tried to focus a lot on like keeping the energy light leading up to worlds because like we had already gone the year before so like obviously there was pressure like to go back and do even better so we always tried to keep things light but and always have fun and our teammates are a really big part of that also like just always pushing us to the max so we're like really they're a really big part of us getting ready for worlds but um yeah but we always had that ability to like the on and off switch, like be able to have fun and then know when to be serious and like also like just be competitive. So that was pretty much our plan leading up to the worlds. Awesome, thanks. You know, keeping it light and keeping it fun um, in your prep for youth worlds, I would imagine perhaps you're you have that same mindset a little bit as you carried into windsurfing and learning this new sport, trying not to take yourself too seriously. Um, you know, what, what's, what's your mindset been like as you, as you go through windsurfing now, trying to figure it out? Um, well, you know, it's just, it's fun, you know, like I'm learning it right now, not really to train for anything. I'm just learning how to windsurf because I want to. So it's really, it's really great. That's awesome. As far as your learning curve, windsurfing, do you think that uh, um, trapezing on the 29er, is there anything that was complimentary you found you were able to rely on your 29er experience coming to the windsurfer? Or do you, you feel like you just started from scratch? Um, I think definitely trapezing has helped, especially in the 29er where it's really about balance and coming into the windsurfing, that's been really helpful. Also just like understanding the concept of like pressing into harness straps and like, I mean, even though there's not straps with windsurfing, like just like being able to press with your shoulders and, you know, get the speed. Yeah, that full body experience, skiff sailing yeah. definitely relatable to the windsurfer. Um, Hey, Phil, I'm going to pop in just a question for the audience there for, for Bella, um, kind of what were your biggest surprises stepping onto the board from a sailboat? So anything that caught you totally off guard or pleasant surprises or um, just little adjustments that you had to make that really stick out in your mind? Um, I mean, obviously this isn't really a surprise, but fitness is really big coming into the windsurfer. I mean, as a 29er crew, I mean, it was a lot of work, but uh, not like this. This is different. This is way more like endurance and like, 
you have to be able to like hold yourself the whole time. Awesome. Practice, practice gets that endurance up, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to jump back in and uh, follow up with a question to Marion. Marion, you took some time off of Stanford to go to the Olympics. Uh, I, I think you're in graduate school right now. Is that right? I mean, tell us, tell us what you're doing now in your life uh, academically and if you're able to get out on the water at all. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing a PhD, actually. So I will be in school for a long time. Um, but I, I made that decision because I realized that there were some key academic uh, questions in robotics specifically that I was super excited about. And I wanted um, kind of like the way I was excited about the Olympics. Like I wanted to go down deep and really understand it because it's like super exciting to me. Um, but I have also realized after, after I came back from Rio, I was kind of burnt out from the RSX because the RSX is a lot to handle. And I kind of went all in and, and just stopped the RSX and just um, enjoyed school for a bit. And I kind of enjoyed it too much and got burnt out from just school and I really miss windsurfing. Um, and so I found this great balance where um, there's still a really active fleet of windsurfers in San Francisco um, who are, uh, who like, windsurf and race just really for the fun of it like there's no olympics out there it's just to have a good time um and it's how i started windsurf racing and i really enjoyed it and so i've just rejoined that group and over i think from may to october we have races um and almost every other weekend in the bay in different spots um and it's all foiling now and so i've kind of found that balance where uh i really focus on school in the winter and then over the summer, spring and fall, I get to actually spend time windsurfing and racing over the weekends. And it's a, honestly the best of both worlds where I have um, I found something I really love academically and I can still windsurf and race. Um, and if I decide maybe that I want to go um, more intensely on the foil, maybe that option will be available if in the future, um, trying to keep those doors open. Well, <clears throat> I, I'll speak personally, but I'm sure everyone listening to this is is extremely jealous of you uh, being able to race and, and foil with a group of great windsurfers from May to October. That just sounds incredible. Um, the, the RSX is a beast of a board. It's, it's incredibly challenging. And now with the new selection of uh, the IQ foil, I mean, you're French, Marion. I mean, obviously you're an American, but uh, representing Team USA, you must be excited about that foil board being in the games for 2024. I'm so stoked and so jealous it wasn't around back when I was like, why was the RSX the board that I had to start out with if I, uh, for the international racing scene? Um, but I think it's such a tremendous, like, uh, decision that uh, the community has made to transition to the foil because it's just a lot of fun and um, I think most people most people that you meet who are interested in the windsurfing international racing scene are really doing it for fun because they love windsurfing as a sport um, and I think the foil will speak much more to that than this RSX um, that was just like very grueling um, so I think it's awesome I think it's I guess I would really encourage people to try it because it feels like like you're flying and it, it's just a sensation you don't really find anywhere else. Um, the crashes are a bit big, but like it's part of the adrenaline um, and you like you're going to come out of the water feeling like you had an awesome time. Um, so I'm I it was also awesome to start for me because I felt like I was kind of bored, honestly, of the RSX and I felt like I wasn't um, improving in the way that I used to and uh, starting with a foil was uh, as a previous windsurfer felt like I was able to relearn these new skills and I hadn't experienced that kind of a learning curve before um, and I was just taking wipeouts I hadn't taken in a long time um, so it kind of brought back some youth into the the sport for me um, and some adrenaline and I felt like um, also kind of reshaped the the racing scene a bit where um, you kind of had a chance to figure out what your techniques are and explore a bit more rather than having this set technique that most of the community has already set upon. I, I kind of like the fact that people are still figuring things out and that you can be a part of that. That's fantastic. 
that uh, getting back to your roots and starting anew is is really humbling and and it's been really fun for me to learn how to foil something Bell is going through. I mean, learning to windsurf now, it sounds like we're all right there. Momo, I think you have some uh, amazing footage for us from uh, foiling in Garda recently. I mean, can you talk to us about what you were doing there, how you got on the gear and uh, and show us that footage would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically, uh, the conclusion of 2019 RSX Worlds um, was kind of a turning point in terms of the Olympic windsurfing community, in the sense that the sea trials are being held to kind of decide and to give people an insight into what the future of windsurfing would look like. Um, and amazingly, the foil was considered again among one of the top classes. And so I was lucky enough to be there and be part of the, uh, the experience and as a member of the team to kind of be able to test out the foils on in their Olympic capacity. This foil that we see here is actually the Olympic equipment. Um, and so I've done a, a decent amount of foiling previous to this, but really being able to test again, the just the sheer technological like advancement and progression that they've made in this year in the past couple of years is truly amazing. And I think I'm just gonna play the video because it speaks for itself really. Um, like Marion was saying, and like Phil was saying, it, it truly is a sensation of flying. Um, and it's extremely technical. It's, it's hard work, but at the same time, it's, it's unlike anything else, you know? It gives you another feeling of the sport. It's a new feeling. Your board's no longer in contact with the water. So it's, it has to do a lot with um, balance and kind of aerodynamic common aero and hydrodynamic combinations of equipment set up and body positioning. And um, I would say, I mean, I would venture to say this, I'm a windsurfer, so I'd love to, you know, to brag a little bit about this, but I'd say it's probably technically the now the most complex Olympic equipment in terms of high performance and really the differences that any small adjustments can make at high speeds and um, maneuvers like we are seeing in foiling nowadays. It's pretty amazing. I mean, you just need to look at uh, the new America's Cup boats and, and look at how they trim their wings and move through the water, the angles they sail and the speed uh, and see the relationship with what you're talking about in that clip that you showed us, Momo. Um, you know, you talk about what you're focused on. I think it would be great maybe if, if you could show that clip again and if you could really break, uh, break apart what you're thinking about, what you're trying to do with your technique. Uh, that'd be a nice little tutorial you could give us all who are learning to fly. Oh, absolutely. So in the clip here, I'm going to pause it for a second and zoom in and kind of show you what the makeup of the equipment is. So the equipment is essentially a windsurf sail in, in a general sense, no different from historical windsurfing sails in the sense that you still use a mass, the boom and the sail itself. Um, but there are a lot of different shaping characteristics in this windsurf sail as compared to the RSX or, or conventional windsurfing equipment. But essentially it's a sail mounted on a windsurfing board like any other. The only difference is that now instead of having a fin in the water, you have a foil coming out of the fin box, which has a wing, which has wings on the bottom of the foil stem, the black foil stem you see here, shaped very much like an airplane. Um, essentially the idea is very similar to the flight of an airplane. Um, the wings generate lift and they lift your board up out of the water when you're sailing and that reduces friction um, by a large order of magnitude, allowing you to go a lot faster and then manipulate your speed and the lack of friction to actually change your sailing angles due to your apparent winds. Um, so essentially the keys in sailing this equipment is stability. Um, again, no one wants to fly a plane while it's jumping back around, back and forth and diving and dipping. Um, so essentially the more stable you are, 
the more you can focus on the small technical characteristics of the sailing itself and the faster you can go. So essentially what you're doing is you're trying to balance the draft, the pressure from the sail combined with the pressure from your body to really keep an even angle in the board and try to keep the board flying at a decent height above the water as stable as possible. And upon doing that, there are some, again, more complicated technical characteristics in terms of manipulating your sail angle and your board angle to try to achieve um, the maximum performance you can out of the equipment. But technically the idea behind foiling is you wanna get up, you wanna be stable, and then you wanna manipulate the design of the foil and the equipment to get you as much upwind lift and speed as possible. So again, although this was in early stages of uh, foil sailing with this new equipment, um, you can kind of see the whole deck of the board instead of just a side view. And this is a result of trying to angle the board to windward, which seems kind of um, counterintuitive to most sailors, considering that windward heel is usually undesirable in most boats. Um, but in doing so on a windsurf equipment, you maximize on windsurf foiling, you maximize lift out of the foils of the equipment under you, and you're actually able to get um, the best performance out of the equipment you're sailing. Just like, I don't know if maybe it's too small to see, but you see the other board back here sailing on starboard. I might play the video a little bit to see. You see that their board, you see the bottom of the board as a result of, again, this windward heel, this windward incline, trying to maximize um, the lift you're getting out of the equipment. And again, that's just the result of having a foil on the bottom of your, of your fin in this case. Um, again, America's cut boats are kind of taking a similar approach in terms of maximizing the lift they get out of the foils, modifying heels, especially the monohulls now. Um, you'll see they tend to have a slight windward heel going up wind in some cases to try to maximize this lift or they change the foil angles. So um, essentially this is kind of a mirror of their process, just adapted to windsurfing. Amazing. Thanks Momo for taking through all that uh, technical stuff for us. I want to hear from Leandro. You've been you've been quiet for a while now. We want to bring you in on the conversation, um, Leandro. You are a huge fan of windsurfing and uh, have worked with all all these athletes here. You know, and behind the helm at ODP, and the U.S. has come a long way. I would say with its relationship to to windsurfing. You know, where are we where are we right now, and what are you looking forward to? In, from your desk? Well, where we are today, I will say we're on the early days of bringing Windsor back to, to the nest, to where it was actually developed and created. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of Windsor uh, as a sailor. I think it's the most organic way of sailing. The sensations of Windsor are unbelievable. I'm terrible at windsurfing, but probably is the uh, discipline that I have the most fun with. Um, and I'm learning to foil now. So another comment that listening to the three amazing athletes here is for too long, they were talking about life, goal settings, discipline. They were not really talking about windsurfing. And, and I think that's one of the missing things in America is I wish all sailors understand that windsurf is a valid path for competing at the highest level. At the same time, Echo and Marion is probably the most fun. And you can develop yourself as a great sailor competing or just having fun. You know, um, in challenging times like right now with COVID-19, you hear me, Phil. I I'm telling every single sailor that crossed my path if you cannot go sailing with your sailing partner because it's in a different town or you have restrictions, just go windsurfing because you're gonna improve so much as a sailor and you're gonna have fun. Um, so when it comes to the performance side of things and ODP, when we started the program, thanks to the support of American One, one of the conversations were, well, windsurf 
is an Olympic discipline, it's in the youth worlds, and we're gonna lay the path for athletes to embrace the discipline and became competitive and champions. And we check some boxes there, and we're gonna continue growing the support to the discipline. Now with foiling, it's such an exciting time. So I, I cannot be anything but excited about the future. Awesome. Um, I'm going to jump in here. We have a, a technical question from Zach. Um, he's tuning in with uh, Dimensions Polyant Sailcloth, and he's uh, supplying the sa fabric for Severn. And he's wondering if is the shape and profile of the new sail dramatically different than the older RS? And I don't know who wants to take that, that question, maybe Marion or Momo. I think I can start because we've been, we've been talking a lot and looking into this a decent amount. And based, essentially the sail profile of foiling windsurf sails is a lot taller, but a lot thinner, meaning they're not as wide as regular um, windsurfing sails or RS essentially um, windsurf sails. And uh, the reason for this again is just more to do with the aerodynamics of foiling itself. You don't really want, since you have so much air flowing through the sail because of the differences in speeds and the parents, um, the shorter clue actually allows you to make more controlled adjustments rather than a longer clue in a wider sail. Um, it's meant to mimic more of a wing profile. You rarely see a very short, very wide wing for an airplane, um, but uh, you do tend to see longer, thinner ones. Um, so essentially it's just trying to mimic this aspect or target really, essentially it's, it's the same concept in terms of lift and aerodynamics. So it's very closely trying to replicate an airplane wing and kind of clean up all the corners, meaning it attaches the sail to the board very well. You have very clean profile and you have very few spots in which you're losing energy um, or wind power essentially to be able to sail. So it's just maximizing the sport to be faster than ever. Awesome. Anything to add to that, Marion? Or that was pretty comprehensive, Momo. Yeah, no, that was great. Um, we do have a, a question for you, Marion, on your experience at the uh, Rio Games. Um, it's coming in from Jake wondering uh, what non sailor um, Olympic athlete did you enjoy meeting most in 2016? Oh my God. Uh, most is a. Uh the strong word. Um, honestly, I think it was more the, I just enjoy meeting people from other countries the most, I would say. Um, so I, I found that meeting people in the American team, uh, it, you just didn't get the same kind of stories that you did if you just like went and sat in the cafeteria with some other uh, random person from a different country. Um, and so I would just try to find people that might speak English. And with another friend, we would just go at the cafeteria and, and find other uh, sailors that are uh, not sailors, but just uh, people that way. And I think one of the most fun groups we found was, um, I think they were whitewater kayakers. Um, and they just had a, a love for life that you'd like, wouldn't see elsewhere. Um, I think that was really fun. I think the one I was most just like physically stunned by was Usain Bolt. Um, like you even among at the Olympics I think Usain Bolt kind of comes out as an extremely athletic person and so that was uh, really awesome to see but um, uh, otherwise it was really I think stepping out of your comfort zone to leave Team USA and actually go meet people from other countries that was the most special part of being at Rio. Awesome sounds amazing. Um, I think this is another question for you or maybe the group um, and I think it could be an invite is they're wondering, uh, Aaron out in Hawaii is wondering when uh, you all are coming to Hawaii to win foil. I mean, it's, it's on my list. I think it's number one on my list actually of places to go. Uh, but I did hear that the turtles are kind of sad with the foiling in Hawaii. So I guess um, I'm curious about how that uh, actually pans out, but um, I definitely would love to go. We're just talking about doing a ODP camp for foiling, Windsor foiling in Hawaii, Mario. So just to give you excited. I think I will comment that um, 
relative to other sailing, I've never heard of an opti sailor or 420 sailor going to Hawaii to be able to train and sail. So again, that's like one of the few opportunities you only see in windsurfing. Um, I myself have, have windsurfed in Hawaii a couple of times and it's awesome. So the more we can get. Yeah, let me take on that. And I'm going to ask Bella to help me here with business. Bella, what do you need to say? What do you have to say to all the Optic kids around the country and youth sailors about windsurf? Should they take on it or, and learn about it? Okay, so I think that it is a great boat to go and boat, board, board to go into <laughs> because, you know, um, it's, it's fast. You know, I wasn't expecting it to be as fast when I'm standing on the board than it actually was. Like I was expecting it to be just like, you know, like 29er, but like a little faster. But like when I was wiping out, like I was wiping out. Okay, anyway, the point is that um, in if you wanna like sail by yourself, you know, you can go into like laser or like windsurfing, you know, like, and I think windsurfing's a lot faster, you should go there. Yeah. Yeah, also the sport is going in such an excitement, exciting new world, new state that um, everybody likes to have fun on the water. And that's the bottom line. That's what we all love. You know, some people do it for fun. Some people do it to push themselves to the very next level and find the highest competition. But definitely windsurf is, is a valid path for all of that. And even if you look today at CLGP or the Volvo Ocean Race or the America's Cup, you know, the sailors need a set of skills that if you're a young sailor aiming to, to be at the Olympics, Volvo, CLGP or America's Cup, maybe Windsor foiling is the best way to get there. You know, a little bird told me that Glenn Ashby, you know, sailing for Team New Zealand, Windsor foils every day and he helped with his America's Cup sailing and uh, ACAT sailing, you know? And I, I really <laughs> wish every sailor goes to Windsor and have fun, enjoys the sport and gets better. I think I'm gonna add on to Leandro and Bella's comment by saying that I'm by trade a windsurfer, but I did the competition circuits on cats, on Nacaras. I did it on um, as well. I did not sail 420 or laser, but I did sail opties as well. And I don't know if this is maybe too strong of a statement, but as soon as you really learn to windsurf, you kind of throw all the away. Um, I windsurf, I, you, when you train, you train competitively. And when you just want to break from schoolwork or it's windy one afternoon or whatever it may be, my dad, who's 53, still grabs a, a windsurf. You know, um, I don't know how many dads you find selling lasers nowadays for fun. So it's just, it's kind of as an example, it goes to show really anybody can enjoy the sport and it really is amazing. I, I just want to clarify, I was not saying you should win surf and not sail your laser or your 420 or any class. I'm just saying windsurf can enhance your sailing skills because honestly it's the more, most organic way. So if you want to be a champion in any other class, you can still use windsurf as a cross platform to, to get better. And I'm one of those that now that is falling. <laughs> Well, I think the message is very clear and <clears throat> thanks, thanks everybody for chiming in there. Um, certainly this summer is an opportunity to try something new and build new skills uh, and social distance by being out on the water, windsurfing by yourself and crashing and picking yourself up. Uh, absolutely. Justine, any other questions before we uh, wrap up here? Yeah, definitely. We I think every, everyone can have an opportunity to answer this, but uh, for the sailors or general public that are sitting at home, what are some good recommendations for kind of step one of getting onto the windsurfer 
any um, thoughts on maybe a community you can get involved with. We do have in the chat, uh, the WIPA, so Windsurfing Instructors and Program Association. Um, but uh, any other ways maybe in San Francisco for first timers in Miami? Um, I know Momo, I think you're out in Salt Lake. Um, so just a little bit of advice of kind of taking that first step and getting your feet wet. If uh, we want to start with you, Marion. Um, I mean, I was spoiled, ridiculously spoiled when I started. I had a, a dad who went out with me every single time and swam after me and would de-rig and rig for me and uh, did everything to make it as pleasant as possible. Um, and obviously that's not feasible for everyone, but I guess I would, um, I would encourage people not to get turned away by just one negative experience because windsurfing can be really hard to learn, but if you are set up in the right environment, it's actually really fun and really pleasant. And so um, I would say start out where somewhere where the water is actually like fairly calm, like at the San Francisco is awesome place to windsurf. In fact, it's my favorite place to windsurf in the world, but it was not a great place to start off of Chrissy Fields. So don't try something and get discouraged. Like try to ask around and see where good places are. Um, if you're in the San Francisco Bay area, I learned in Foster City Lagoon and it's uh, by far, I think the best place to learn. And I, it's where I take my friends to learn how to windsurf because it has a nice grassy um, area and along the entire shore and it's well protected. Um, and I'd say also really ask around about what equipment you're starting out on. Um, I think a beginner equipment has really improved over the years and it has made it a lot more pleasant to get started. And if you're trying on really old stuff, you might get discouraged too soon because it might feel too hard. Um, so uh, I guess asking around to see if you can find borrow some, some beginner equipment um, could be helpful. Oh, and the St. Francis has great um, windsurfing camps for uh, youth, actually, at, up by Tinsley, where it's way more sheltered and protected. Um, I've never done it myself, but I've heard great things. So definitely ask around for the Tinsley St. Francis Yacht Club windsurfing camps. Yeah, absolutely. Tinsley Island back in the Delta where the water gets warm uh, and the wind still kicks in the summertime is a great, great area for Bay Area sailors. Um, Phil and Bella and even Leandro, do you want to speak a little bit ab about opportunities in the Miami, South Florida area and just for those sailors looking to, to start out? Bella, Bella, why don't you take this one and tell us how you got started since you came to the sport most recently? Okay, so I began by getting um, on the like small team at Miami Yacht Club. They have like a few people there and some coaches and I just kind of joined the team. It was just once a weekend and not everyone there has like a big sailing background at all. Like, you know, there, it was a really fun group, all ages, but um, yeah, I just learned there and then I just bought my own and began to practice like on my own and with you, Phil. So that's what I did. But I know there's also a team out of Biscayne Bay Yacht Club that has a, like a lot of kids. Certainly Clearwater on the west coast of Florida um, and there are hot spots all over the US. Yeah. Something that we keep alluding to but haven't said directly here is that the windsurfing community is extremely tight knit. Uh, everyone is a part of the same family and, and willing to share equipment, help lend resources, share advice. And that goes from learn to sail all the way, as Marion told us earlier, to the, the highest level of the sport that's built into the culture. So um, just reach out if you want to get started. Awesome. Um, we also have another question here for, for Momo. Um, any special advice for being overpowered on the foil, still learning and find it tough when I can't downsize the rig? Explanation point. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd say um, that's one of the big things in foil windsurfing. Um, it is it is a lot. Windsurfing in general is it can be pretty challenging when you're when you're pushing the limits, just like um, like other parts of sailing. And foiling is more about learning the intricacies, like the little tips and tricks. Um, I mean, I'm not sure what equipment you're sailing on, but you can play with the backwind angles of most foils to generate less lift. So your board is jumping out of the water less. You can try different uh, sail adjustments, for example, more downhaul, more outhaul. 
alcohol um, for being overpowered on the foil. You will really want to crank that on. And um, mass space adjustments is also one of the really big ones. Um, if you're overpowered and your foil keeps jumping out of the, your board keeps jumping out of the water, just move it forward and that will uh, put a little more weight on the nose of your board and try to stop the board from jumping out so much. So again, it's just trial and error. Certain things work for certain people. So just have fun with it and try a couple of different things and see what works for you. Awesome. Marion, did you have any, any other tips for, for Matt? I'm um, down. Honest, honestly, I downsized. I'm still not on the Olympic equipment and uh, San Francisco is so windy that you like can't survive out there if, unless you downsize. Um, and the other thing I do if it comes up on me quickly is I just get out of the harness. Um, it's really tiring and you won't go as fast, but you'll avoid the nasty wipeouts that you might otherwise um, do. And so sometimes if it's just a quick gust and I'm still not confident yet, I'll get out of the harness for a few seconds and get back in um, and just be really dynamic with that. Um, but it's something I'm really struggling with still. So I'd love to <laughs> find, get more tips on that as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. It sounds like the struggle, the struggle is real on the board, but uh, doesn't take away from the fun. Um, we have uh, another, just a comment, uh, slash question for for Bella San Francisco Bay sounds fun uh when do you think um you're going to be ready for it do you think you're ready now to to jump out and uh give it a try on the bay um in a tech no <laughs> yeah <laughs> but I'm excited to get into foil boarding I want to get into it sooner than later Awesome. Um, we also had a, a good friend and uh, coach of U.S. Sailing, Richard Feeney, tuning in just for the end of this talk, but because uh, he was just out on the water um, in a 5.0 square meter doing a session um, with the Techno 293. And he said, uh, it's sweet and sunny nor'easter up in New England. And uh, that's uh, for all the New England based sailors. That's a great contact to to reach out to, you can Google him online. Um, huge supporter of youth sailing and development um, out in uh, New England. So uh, look up Richard Feeney. I'm sure he'll uh, get you, definitely get you access to some boards. But uh, I think uh, that's all for the questions. Um, really appreciate everyone for joining us today. Um, Thank you um, for all for being a part of the portal. We encourage um, the audience to keep tuning in um, for later this week for more live sessions. And uh, please know that your membership and your support is what helps keep these programs running, the kids training and uh, more camps in the future. Um, thank you for our US Sailing members and donors who support our organization. Um, if you'd like to join, renew or make a donation, please visit our website and do so. Um, and thank you again all of the panelists and sailors um, who joined us and uh, thank you for being a part of U.S. Sailing. Really appreciate the time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Justine. Thanks, everybody.